your system. The Tai Chi has seen yet another revamp, and this time on the new Z490 platform, as Rock has somewhat toned down that whole steampunk clockwork look we saw on Z390, and this new board resembles more what we saw on X570, but instead of a silver and black colour palette, we're now seeing a bronzish gold and black look which I'm really digging. In this video, I'll cover the main features of the Z490 Tai Chi, then follow with some testing and benchmarks. I won't dive too much into direct CPU benchmarks, as this video is more about the motherboard itself and checking out how this VRM cooling performs. I have done a time-lapse build video with this board. I will include synthetic and gaming benchmarks at the end of that video. ASRock still include a nice looking backplate just like on the X570 Tai Chi, but this time they have actually added thermal pads between for extra rear VRM cooling. RGB is subtle and nothing too over the top, with RGB coming from the I.O. cover, chipset heatsink, and also board edge lighting. ASRock have now brought this feature back, and all the RGB can now be controlled straight from the BIOS. The only need for installing any RGB software is for, say, RAM or other third-party RGB control. Four RGB headers can be found in total, two 12 volt 4-pin standard RGB, one at the bottom and one near the 24-pin, while two 3-pin 5 volt ARGB headers can be found, one at the bottom and one at the top. If you watch my Z490 Velocitor overview video, you'll notice both of these boards do have a similar layout in terms of IO cover design, VRM cooling, and some of the features. Power delivery you find a 14 phase driver MOSFET design running an SL69269 PWM, SCIC65450 amp MOSFETs, and 60 amp choke. Two A pin EPS are located at the top of the board for running those beefy 10900K CPUs. VRM cooling is much the same as the Velocitor, and ASRock seem the only ones going down the path of dedicated active VRM cooling. Three fans complete this cooling setup, with two located on the top VRM heatsink and one embedded in the left VRM heatsink. ASRock have also incorporated a finned heatsink design, which I'm really happy to see. In most cases, these always perform better than just a solid block of aluminum, provided there is some airflow. I'll cover VRM temps and any fan noise a bit later on. PCIe Gen 4 has also been a hot topic with Z490. And yes, the Z490 Tai Chi has the first two 16 by slots Gen 4 capable and one of the M.2 slots Gen 4 capable as well. But you'll have to wait to use these features. Common Lake S CPUs that have just launched like the 10900K do not support the Gen 4 standard. You'll have to wait for Intel Rocket Lake CPUs to use any Gen 4 capabilities on this board. That means M.2.4, the dedicated Gen 4 M.2 slot, will not work for now, regardless if you install a Gen 3 M.2 SSD. Memory-wise, you'll find four DIMM slots supporting up to 4,666 MHz plus OC. I threw in a set of my Team Group Extreme 4133 BDI kit and was able to run a nice 4,600 MHz. While with my Trident Z Neo 3600 kit, I was able to run an OC of 4,400 MHz. PCIe slot layout is pretty standard here, running 16, 8, and 4 if all three slots are populated, and as mentioned earlier, the first two slots are Gen 4 capable, and also backwards capable to Gen 3. Storage is pretty good, with a total of 4 M.2 slots, 3 M.2 Gen 3 slots will work out of the box, with that fourth Gen 4 slot coming available later on. All these support PCIe M.2 SSDs, with M.2 slots 2 and 3 supporting SATA M.2 SSDs as well. M.2 cooling is provided for all the M.2 slots via thermal pads on the covers. With nothing new to really test here, I ran a Gen 3 NVMe test with my WD Black SN750 SSD. As you can see, the results are pretty much bang on. And after copying 100GB of data, saw the drive temp rise to 60 degrees while on my test bench. For other storage, there's 6 Intel SATA ports supporting RAID 0, 1, 5 and 10 and two more SATA ports running off an ASMedia ASM1061 controller, which is pretty standard for ASRock these days. Networking ASRock has installed an ADA 211AX Wi-Fi module for 2.4 gigabit speeds, a Realtek Dragon 2.5 gigabit LAN adapter, and also an Intel i219B 1 gigabit adapter can be found. As this is a new platform, I always like to test out the AX wireless and 2.5 gigabit LAN. Shout out to TP-Link for sending out their new top-of-the-line Archer AX11000 router for testing purposes. This thing is an absolute beast. For Wi-Fi testing, I use the 2.5 gigabit WAN port 
as the uplink port to a PC running a 10 gigabit ethernet adapter to remove any bottlenecks. With the router and Z490 Taichi within 4 meters of each other, I saw a connection speed between 2.4 to 2.1 gigabit with a transfer speed of 180 megabytes per second. Next test was performed with the router 12 meters away from the Z490 Taichi but still in line of sight. Here I saw a link speed of 1.7 to 1.9 gigabit and a transfer speed of 155 megabytes per second. And the last test saw the router and Z490 Taichi on two different stories, with the router being on the first floor and the Z490 Taichi on the second floor directly above the router with a standard wooden floor separating. Here I saw a link speed of 1.4 gigabit and a transfer speed of 130 megabytes per second. For anyone running AX Wireless, make sure you set your channel width to 160 megahertz in your wireless router setting to take full advantage of that 2.4 gigabit speed. For the 2.5 gigabit LAN, I pretty much tested the same, but instead of using the TP-Link router, I just ran a direct connection to the secondary PC running a 10 gigabit ethernet adapter. Here we can see speeds are pretty much bang on point here at 284 megabytes a second. As one gigabyte has been around forever, I'm not gonna worry about testing that. Adrock is stuck with a Realtek ALC1220 audio codec for their onboard solution, but have added an ESS Sabre 9218 DAC for front panel audio with a 130 dB signal to noise ratio, which is a nice touch. Eight fan headers are dotted around the board with all supporting the water pump feature. Moving on to rear IO, we find Azrock's flexible IO shield that works quite well, and I'm glad Azrock have brought back the BIOS flashback button. This allows you to flash the BIOS without the need of a CPU or memory installed. The associated USB for this is the one above the USB type C port. DisplayPort 1.4 and HDMI ports are located at the top of the I.O. Both support true 4K resolutions, 60Hz for the DisplayPort and 30Hz for the HDMI at that res. A total of 8 USB ports can be found on the rear, 5 3.2 Type-A Gen 1 ports, 2 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A 10 Gigabit ports and 1 3.2 Gen 2 x 2 20 Gigabit Type-C port that runs off an ASMedia ASM3242 controller. Other features include a Dr. Debug LED and onboard power and reset buttons. So I've pretty much covered most of the board. Now I did say earlier, I do want to cover the VRM fans and also the VRM temperatures. I'll jump in that in just a sec. You might be wondering what this build here is doing here. So I decided to whip up a quick little Tai Chi themed build based around the uh, Z490 chipset. So this build won't be featured in this video. I have done a full time that's build like I normally do. But um, the reason why I haven't uh, released this video yet is because I've added a bunch of benchmarks at the end. So there'll be gaming benchmarks, a few CPU benchmarks, and some temperatures related to this build. So nothing like on my test bench, which I was testing, uh, testing for this video, but those temperatures will be related to this system. This is running a pretty beefy, uh, pretty beefy cooling system. There's a 360, 60 millimeter radiator, a slim 240 up the top and so on. But yeah, that's why I couldn't release that yet. Um, if I didn't do the benchmarks, I could have released it already. And hey, I could have been um, one of many who have launched videos that apparently is, this, is the first Z490 build out there. So, um, but yeah, I will release the benchmarks, release this build in a few days after this video. Now, jumping to the test. Now, I do apologize. I will be reading a bit off my laptop as I don't really want to skip or miss any information. So as I said earlier, all tests are for this video, the VRM testing and the VRM uh, fan noise uh, test were performed on my test bench. It is the one just behind me. Um, and that consisted of a CPU only loop. It had an EKXE 480 radiator. It had a standard D5, a bits power CPU block, and it had, had four noise blocker fans and they were on the default motherboard CPU PWM. So they would speed up and speed down depending on the CPU load. Now, moving down to the VRM fans. So default speed, the VRM fans ran at around 2500 RPM. Now these fans go up to 8000. So in the BIOS, you can set them to max, which is 8000, or you can put them to completely off, which I do test that later on. But the standard operating uh, RPM is about 2500 RPM, which is basically inaudible. So here's the test I've done. I do have my little uh, DB reader as well. So here's a test of them running normal, uh, system fans running and the pump running as well. So let's check out that noise. So as you can see, it's very hard to uh, very hard to get that actual noise because we do have a bit of vibration from the pump. We've got four fans on the radiator 
as well. Now, I actually decided to unplug the pump, unplug the fans, not really recommended to do, but hey, I just did this for the purpose to actually see if I could hear any VRM fan noise of the system just running in Windows. I only did it for a short time, so let's have a look if there's any sound at all coming from these VRM fans at uh, normal sort of temperatures. Now, as you can see, there is not much change there at all, if any. Now, I had this system or my room here completely quiet. I did this test at about 1 a.m. I had all my computers off. Hell, I even unplugged my closest fridge. And I was actually surprised to see like 36 decibels was the normal uh, room, uh, room sound because I reckon I could drop a pin and I would have heard it. So as you can see, with just the three VRM fans, now the video card did have one fan running, but it was so silent, I couldn't even hear that either. So now to really, really, I mean, really get these fans going, I loaded up Prime 95 with AVX on, and then I ran this for about 10 minutes. And now this CPU was pulling over 300 watts. So it was really stressing the system. Now these fans ran at about 5,000 RPM. So remember they maxed out at eight. So 5,000, they're getting up there. And now over all the other system noise uh, with the pump, now the radiator fans were running full ball. I can guarantee you any other system, uh, you put this on, whether it's an all-in-one cooled system, a air cool system, the fans are going to be flat out and I still couldn't hear the VRM fans. Now just for last, I went into the BIOS and I set the fans at max, which was 8,000 RPMs and now let's have a listen. As you can see, they do go off like a jet engine, but I was never able to achieve any of this noise with any of my testing I did. Now, Prime 95 with AVX on is the probably the most unrealistic testing you are going to do, unless for some reason this is something you do. And even at 5,000 RPM for the fans, I still could not hear them. So in short, these VRM fans will not make any audible noise during normal Windows operation. Even gaming, in even Cinebench, they did not uh, sort of crank up to a audible level at all. Now, VRM cooling. As I said earlier, I use Prime 95 with AVX on. Now, for me, this is not practical, especially for CPU uh, testing. When I do bench this system for my CPU temperatures, I'll run through some things like Cinebench, uh, some game testing, 3D Mark sort of testing, real world testing. Not running, uh, not running Prime 95 for say 20 minutes and absolutely slaughtering the CPU. But I did do it for the VRM testing because I wanted the most power draw I could get out of, I'll keep pointing to this system, but I wanted the uh, most power draw out of the test bench I was testing this on. Now, I did run the CPU at stock. I do want to clarify that, and I also want to clarify my CPU is the 10900KF, so it's not the K, it's the KF, so that might be slightly different to others that you're seeing uh, if you're watching any other videos on these CPUs. Now, I did get the CPU to run an all-core 5.2 gigahertz. It was stable in gaming, it was stable in Cinebench, but it was not stable in my Prime 95 with AVX on. Now, I'm not really too concerned about that. Uh, for me, I'm happy with 5.2 in gaming and everywhere else. Prime 95 is very, very hard. Uh, to get high OCs going and running completely stable. So I did run the CPU stock just to see how it would go with, uh, with that setting. Now, the reason why I also use Prime 95 is a lot of reviewers will be using different methods of testing their VRMs and even their CPUs. Now, I've just done a few examples I'm gonna throw up on the screen. So running, say, Cinebench, uh, running that a few times, I only drew 225 watts. Now running something like A to 64, which a lot of people do is they tick the first three options, which is CPU, uh, FPU, and then the cache. Now, as you can see, that's drawing 192 watts. Now doing A to 64 with FPU only, 236 watts, and now A to 64 with CPU only is 123 watts. Now, when I'm doing VRM testing, that's quite a bit off my 315, nearly 320 watts I was getting in Prime 95. So that's why I stuck to Prime 95, because that is just crazy amount of wattage uh, we are pushing through this motherboard. Now, for temp testing, I installed K-type probes uh, on the motherboard around the VRMs. I stuck one on the back of the board, uh, because now the Azure board does have some thermal pads on that back plate, which I'm glad they added. I added some on the, one on the FETs, and then one on the chokes. Now, with Prime 95 running for 10 minutes, with, of course, AVX on, let's have a look. Now, I've got my photo here. 
All right, so I did two tests, uh, two lots of tests. The top uh, blue ones are with the VRM fans on, and I decided to turn them all off in the gray ones, which is the second test. Now, the two VRM fans at the very top, when you set it to silent mode in the BIOS, they actually turn off. The one over to the I.O. cover doesn't turn off, it spins slightly. I even jammed a little bit of cardboard in there to make sure that was completely stopped as well. All uh, right, now, Starting with the CPU benchmark or CPU test for this one, that doesn't really matter too much. Both ran about 86, 87 degrees. That's not really impacted too much. Now starting with the back of the VRM, uh, for 10 minutes in the prime with the VRM fans on, we saw 52 degrees on the back and then down below with the VRMs off, we saw the back jumping up to 73 degrees. So that's about 20 degrees increase uh, with not having the fans on. Moving down to the chokes with the VRM fans on, we saw 55 degrees and then down below with them off, we saw 77 degrees, so about the uh, 20 degrees again. And then the FETs down below the last one, we saw 50 degrees with the VRM fans on, and then we saw 66 with them off. So as you can see, the fans are definitely, definitely doing their job. Now, to me, whether these temperatures are good or bad, I can't really sort of tell you right now. I don't have any other boards to test. The only other board I've got is, I would say, the little brother to this, the Velocita, and that still has the same type of VRM cooling. So I would assume the results would be very similar. I'd have to grab a board that is from a different brand and so on to really, uh, to really test these out. And I never saw any VRM throttling uh, or anything like that. So I was really impressed with just how these VRMs held up. And even this was the, probably the, the worst degree I could have thrown at the CPU and the VRMs to really get them heated up and really, really going. Now, some other things, my main issue with the uh, Tai Chi board, the Zeppelinoni Tai Chi from ASRock, is it is the second top of the line board that ASRock has to offer. The top of the line is the Aqua. We all know that comes out at about uh, 1699 Australian. Then this comes down at the 689. So you're looking at nearly, or well, pretty much a thousand dollars less. There is no board in the middle. So we all know the Aqua is limited to 999 uh, editions. So once that runs out, this is then going to be the top of the line board. Now for me, I find that's an issue. That means there's no other board from ASRock that has say 10 gigabit network. There's no other board that has the VRM capacity like on the Aqua because I believe that is a 16 phase. So to me, I think there should be something like a Creator or even a Tai Chi Ultimate that is similar to the Aqua, doesn't have the water block, but has the 10 gigabit ethernet and that beefier VRM that is on the Aqua. Now, another thing I want to mention is the RGB control from the, from the BIOS. I absolutely love that feature. You can't do everything with it. You can't sync your RGB memory. You can't sync your keyboard and mouse external devices. But I was able to set this whole system up, all the lighting, control, everything I needed to, even the external headers straight from the BIOS. I didn't need to install any pesky RGB software. Now, the last thing I want to cover is the price. Price of this uh, Tai Chi board is 689 Australian, and that makes it at about 369 US dollars. So pretty much ballpark, uh, to me, $700 Australian is creeping up to high end. But when we're looking at this launch, a lot of boards are creeping up around the 900. There's quite a few boards over 1,000, and I think there's even a gigabyte board over $2,000. So yeah, it is getting up there, 689. I had no issues with this board whatsoever. Everything tested fine. You saw the VRM results. I guess I'll have to wait to see someone like Hardware Unbox. Uh, hopefully his VRM testing sort of lines up uh, with mine if he does test this board. And um, yeah, I was overall impressed with it. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. Stay tuned for the time that's built for this one. I'll drop it in a few days. I'll go over this whole build and I'll throw all the gaming and CPU benchmarks at the end and I'll see you in the next one.